these women work from 4 a.m. in the morning to late evening. They are put in a position whereby they have to choose overriding any other circumstance around them, including exposing themselves and their children to this kind of hazards in order to earn a living. My name is Nanis Kanana. I'm an occupational health and safety and sustainability professional. And on this project, I'm the lead for the risk assessment for Fishermonga women in Kisumu. By 6 a.m., they have traveled about two hours to be at the lake by 6 a.m. When they get to the lake, they have to wait for the fishermen to come back with the fish. When the fishermen arrive, the women have to go inside the boat to select the fish that they would like. From there, we would observe the women uh, riding on the border border to go back to the market. The important first thing to do is to understand how people are, are working, because understanding the tasks enables you to be able to identify the hazards that they might be exposed to. There are glaring gaps, and it's unfortunate to hear that uh, these gaps have already led to incidents. So once you are done, do you have like a specific place where you store? It was uh, quite interesting to see the women trying to manage with what they have. Because from what I'm observing, mm. this is a work area. Yeah. So is there a specific place where once you're done, you can be able to take and maybe stop? Once it is done, mm. it is not supposed to be here. There are so many concerns around the, the kind of work they are doing. When they're processing the fish and scraping off the scales and filleting them, then they're dealing with very sharp knives. And these, these fish have got very sharp um, fins, which, so you can get puncture wounds in the hand. We were able to interact with one lady who was doing the scaling, and we were actually keen to know, uh, do the scales get into the eyes? I was really being able to talk to a few women involved in that particular process, and some of them confessed to already been having high eyesight problems. Kutoka asubui andi sangapi? Andi jioni. Kuna wakati wo uingi yangi, ama unaingia kila siku Monday to Sunday. Monday to Sunday. So wewe ilo wakati unachukua a break, yani useme unaacho unapumzika ama maybe kula lunch? Maybe tu naenda kula lunch. Daika kangapi? Kukika sana 15 minutes. 15 minutes. When they're frying, they're using deep fat fryers. So they're dealing with hot oil, they often get burns and splashes. So there's quite a lot there in terms of the potential for um, harm um, in, in what they do. Yeah, you can feel the heat is intense. They yeah. just, uh, you know, we yeah, are about a meter away, it's quite intense. So I can just imagine the person who has to be exposed to that the whole day. Mm -hmm. How many hours are you here? We normally come in the morning at 7, at mm -hmm. and we leave at 7, so that is 12 hours. Is there anyone else, other conditions you've had the ladies complain about? The ladies are normally complaining about the chest. Mm -hmm. uh, the chest, I think, because of the smoke. Mm -hmm. And some of us here even use some toxic method to light fires. They use nylon bags, they mm. use anything. Some of the methods they use to light the fires exposes them to respiratory illness because we have the fumes, we have the smokes, and actually when they inhale that smoke, it can have long-term effects on their lungs. When we went to the flying point, actually there was a lady who had issues with the eyes because of the exposure to, to the heat. Problem in my eyes. You see, you see the eyes? 
her eyes here, you see she has some white. So when you feel very sickly, what do you do? Which hospital do you go to? I don't how do you manage. Because of financial okay. limitations, we've not been able to really access proper medical assistance. Most of them are not able to afford any medical insurance. There's a lady who was carrying her oil from the fire and she fell down with the oil. So she mm. got burnt her face, her body, she's mm. still recovering. How long was that? Uh, it's almost uh, now it's uh, four months. If something happens at work, suddenly that person economically is not generating an income for their family. They may not be able to get health care. So there's a real knock-on effect. So maybe suddenly the kids have to get taken out for education they may be in. And of course, there's no right necessarily to have that education. And you end up in this sort of downward spiral, um, which actually, if the accident hadn't happened at work in the first place, and it was preventable, that's the key thing, it was preventable. Um, you know, you, you can stop many of the sort of um, social consequences and economic consequences that come of that accident. The jikos are open, there are no barriers whatsoever. And also we have the children in that particular place. The risk of really this kid falling inside the fire or even inside the hot oil are really high. As an occupational health and safety professional, I know it's possible for us to empower these women and to put controls in place to make sure that they go to work every day and go back home safe. A risk assessment, a report, never made anybody any safer because it's a piece of paper. It can't make anybody any safer. But what it can do is it can engage people, it is a first step. Um, but it's an important first step because it gives that baseline data in terms of where we are. We are an occupational safety and health charity and that's our remit to keep people safe and healthy in work. We know that all workplace harm is preventable, we know how to fix it, we've just got to galvanise efforts. There are very tangible aspects of what we do. You start to see human beings in that, so real people, real communities, families, the things that we are putting in place with the, those communities are going to make a massive difference. And what can be more motivating than knowing that you have protected life? Here in Kenya, it was very easy to identify how we can support them in their existing projects. One of the, the subgroups that we collaborate with uh, within the Commonwealth is the Commonwealth Business Women African. They do great work. And one of their existing projects was with the fishmonger women. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is so good to be back in Kisumu with you ladies. My name is Nana Wanjao, Vice President, Commonwealth Business Women. Africa. We have been working with the fishmongers for two years and um, we started with training. I'm happy to see you, but I am very, very sad that when we arrived, the first thing we heard that is that since we were last here, you've lost a colleague. Sometimes it's, it makes us wonder, is what we are doing enough? I mean, we are here economically, socially empowering you. But if your health is failing, then what are we doing? Two visits ago, when we visited, one of them had committed suicide. This last visit, they had buried one of their own who died from pneumonia. So you can imagine their mental anguish combined with the inability to earn sufficiently for you and your family. We cannot keep losing our sisters because of the environment we work in. So we are working very hard to bring in other partners to make sure that as we are working on the economic independence, but we are also working on your health. When we started doing the training with these women, uh, we realized, in fact, the first challenge that they brought up was the fact that they actually have issues with their eyes. The aspect of health, safety and wellness became clear to us very quickly that if we want the women to be economically sustainable and independent, we needed to take care of the health and safety issue. We can't do it alone as the Commonwealth Business Women Africa. 
we need other partners and we need collaborators to be able to do it. And that's why in our interaction, it has been key to get to see where their issues or their problem are, and then see the partners that could be able to support in this. The importance of the work Ayoshi is currently doing is really what is going to sustain the work we are trying to do in empowering the women economically. What these reports have enabled us to do is to talk to our partners about how we might make differences locally to get international organisations and investors uh, engaged. But that's not the whole story. If we can help people to become safer and more productive uh, at the same time, that has a knock-on effect within their society because it means that there will be spare um, cash available within their environment so they can not only feed and clothe their, their um, families but they can perhaps pay for medical attention that they need and most importantly they can invest in the future of their countries. So I'm going to show you something that I want it to interest and trigger your mind. This is fish leather. This is really, really wanted in the European and American fashion industries. So we can think of how we could also use that as another source of income for us, okay? Fish leather is a, a byproduct of fish that can also be used there. And this is another skill that can earn these women extra money. They had no clue that there was anything called fish leather. Currently, as they prepare the fillet, the skin is thrown away as waste. So now they know they have to collect that skin. And we are going to train them the next phase on how to produce fish leather. We engage these women in a manner that they have choices. They have options. Choice and option give you power the power for them to choose what they would like to do, how to do it, and that power will now enable them to choose the lifestyles they want. It takes collaborative efforts from different stakeholders to holistically solve the problem of these women. The work you're doing under health and safety and the work we are doing of business empowerment for these women, the two have to go hand in hand. We cannot take care of their health when they can't eat. And yet, we can't give them economic independence where they are able to eat, but they're always in hospital. In occupational health and safety, we say that um, the life of a person is the first priority and the health of someone more than what they are earning. But at the same time, we need to create that balance. But when I look at the situation out across the process, uh, there are several uh, factors around that pose risk to the women. Whatever interventions that we want to put in place, we need to look at it sustainably. We are on the same wavelength in the sense that for it to be sustainable, they must make money while healthy and safe. If the women have more money, then they are able to even channel this money to even uh, initiatives and mitigation measures that around the workplace that affect their, their health and safety. This could not have been more timely because we are coming back to this community in three months' time. That is the point now. I believe our partnership should start from. Uh, we should engage at that level. So part of this training should be around health and safety for the women. And you can now introduce the interventions at that point, right at the beginning. And Anna, I totally agree with you, and I'm really excited to hear that. The women are getting money. We are uh, building their capacity economically and at the same time uh, really taking on the aspects of occupational health and safety so that we're not developing the community disproportionately. Absolutely. It's, it's a deal. We are partners. <laughs> <laughs>